Uh, so let me pray real quick and then uh, we'll get started because I added an extra chapter because we didn't do 18 last week. So, um, so there's a lot to cover and a lot of fun to, to get into. So Father God, thank you so much uh, for the chance to worship you today, God, uh, to read your word, to, um, to study and grow deeper in who you are. Um, God, let it impact us, let it challenge us, let it change us um, so that we can not only understand you better, but we can worship you better. Um, God, that we can grow in our relationship with you um, and cling to the understanding of who you are um, through your word. Uh, God, we love you. We thank you so much for this book, um, this book about hope and the hope that we are going to see in it today. Um, God, we praise you. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Put my phone on silent because it will go off. Um, so last week uh, we were supposed to go through chapter 18. We weren't able to go through chapter 18 because it is both long uh, and can be incredibly in depth, but we're only going to hit a few parts on it just to uh, really highlight it uh, because it, it speaks more towards 19, and so 19 and 20 are a lot more impactful and beneficial for us to grow deeper in. Um, but as we jump into 18, one of the things that I want to remind us on is uh, what Babylon essentially stands for. Babylon, essentially, the term is going to stand for just the enemy of God. Right. So uh, you can you can say anybody is a Babylonian. They're the enemy of God. Right. We, we kind of hold that same thing true in some of our terms, um, terms that are not very endearing. Right. We'll call people left wing and right wing extremists and we'll call people Nazis. And, and so we have a category, too, of people that we don't like or that we think are our enemies. And so we just kind of clump them in under that same umbrella. For the original audience and for the ancient Near Eastern people, Babylon was that. And so anytime the term Babylon is really being used, it's highlighting evil, the enemy. Um, that could be uh, enemy nations, enemy kings, enemy kingdoms, could be Satan, uh, the dragon, could be any number of things. And so when we read it, just process through thinking about Babylon not being a nation, but being a entity, uh, a, a person or a, a kingdom of sorts. Um, because we can look back in history and go, okay, Babylon doesn't exist anymore. So reading this and, and trusting that this is a future telling, Babylon's not going to come back. But the imagery of evil of Babylon is here. And so we can see that Exactly. Yeah. And so you're just kind of they're kind of, this is kind of a, a type cast. Babylon is the enemy of God. Um, so I'm going to read uh, chapter 18 and, and it is long and we will <laughs> start there. Um, <clears throat> all right. 18 goes like this. It says, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, uh, a haunt for every unclean spirit. Now, haunt is, is literally just means prison or bound up. There is a bind up, a binding place um, for every unclean spirit, uh, for every unclean bird, and for every unclean and detestable beast. Uh, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living and then i heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people lest you take part in her sins lest you share in her plagues uh, for her sins are heaped high as heaven and god has remembered her iniquities pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed uh, as she has glorified herself and lived in luxury. So give her a like measure of torment and mourning since in her heart, she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow and mourning I, sh uh, mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. 
and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood. They, man, this is a list and a half right here. Uh, all kinds of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots, slaves, and that is human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and all your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchant of these wars, or wares, who gained wealth from her, will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for this great city was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all the shipmates and seafaring men, sailors, and all those who trade as on the sea stood far off and cried out, cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all uh, who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. The sound of the harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeteers will be heard in you no more. Craftsmen of any craft will be found in you no more. The sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. The light of the lamp shall shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all who have been slain on earth." So that is why we didn't read it last week, because just in reading it, it <laughs> takes a while. Um, but I want to highlight a couple of really cool things uh, that, that go on here in this picture, in this depiction of the judgment uh, of Babylon. Um, the first is we see this, this angel come, show up, this bright uh, angel coming from heaven and, and proclaiming uh, essentially the accusations against Babylon essentially proclaiming this judgment uh, that is to come in verses 2 and 3, uh, that, that it is a, a, a prison, a, a location for all unclean spirits, unclean birds, unclean and detestable beasts, and nations uh, that are drunk off of its, its wealth and its style and everything that it offers. And so this, this angel is bringing these accusations against it, ultimately so that judgment can come. This is kind of like uh, what we see of, of, of a trial, right? You have to bring accusations beforehand in order for judgment to be had. And so this angel is bringing the accusations up. And then we see the second part in verses 4 through 8 is, is this, this act of judgment that comes about. But the thing that I want to highlight in it is the grace that you see. The first thing that judgment comes uh, or says when it's coming from heaven says come out of her my people lest you take part in her sins right like like the thing that baffles me is that we get so lost in our own sins and our own failures that we think god would not like us that god doesn't want me anymore that god doesn't love me anymore that like, like we build shame onto ourselves and yet god is calling out babylon to the point where he says, before his judgments, if you want to turn back and follow me, I'm giving you that other chance, right? Like, it doesn't matter how detestable we are. This is Babylon, this picture of, of the worst of the worst. And yet the first thing God does is he extends his grace for his people to turn back towards him. And I, I mean, that's absolutely amazing when you begin to see and understand, like, when we talk about God's wrath and judgment, his judgment is perfectly righteous. And yet, even in our filth and detestable nature, God still continually extends that offer of grace. And so I, I just, that to me sticks out because I, I love, I love the judgment of God. To me, God, man, it makes him look like just the bad to the bone king that I need, right? Like, but him still offering that. 
After all of the stuff that we've read and, and how some of that overlaps and, and some of it is being showcased, even in spite of that, he still is offering that grace. And so I think that is just something to, to, to cling to inside of this judgment of, of Babylon that we are beginning to see. Um, the next thing that, that I want to show is, is that the world is watching. That it says that everybody, the nations, are watching this destruction. They're watching what is happening um, to Babylon, and they're feeling it. They're they're weeping out loud. They're they're crying because their wealth came from doing business in sin. That's the thing. That, like like the prosperity of the earth and the prosperity of these nations was done in sinfulness. And so now that this sinfulness is being destroyed and they're, they're essentially the link to their sinfulness, right? Like let's call it the devil, right? Satan. And so their connection to this evil allowed them to prosper themselves, to do trades, to do all kinds of different things, to open up more monetary value for themselves. So they are, they're dying to the fact that all of their wealth, all of their power, all of their fame, all of their everything is being destroyed. It says that they will no longer have anybody to trade with. And so they are losing their platform. They're losing their status. And so they're watching this destruction, similar to what we see in Ezekiel with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the, this aspect of the destruction is something that essentially the rest of the world is looking upon. And they're seeing this act of God being put on display. Um, and the final thing that we see of this act being put on display um, is a picture of a great millstone. And this, this, this term millstone is used by Christ um, in, in, in an illustration. Um, the disciples were all around him and, and they were trying to get these children to get away from him because kids back then, they ran amok. Not today. Kids are angels today. Um, but, but kids back then were rather unruly. They kind of ran amok. They were kind of um, like, like uh, uh, mutt dogs, right? You just kind of, they just got in the way. They kind of stole your food, stole your stuff, and just, they were rambunctious. And, and there was no real intrinsic value to them unless you had fields, unless you had things to utilize. And so in major cities, the kids just ran crazy. And so there was a negative connotation with them. And so the disciples, when the kids ran to Jesus, were trying to get the kids away. And Jesus looks to them and he says, look, any one of you, you know, don't stop, let the children come to me. But any one of you who causes any one of these children to sin, it would be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the sea. Essentially, anything that goes into the sea disappears, right? Like Bermuda Triangle kind of stuff, right? And so it, it, God is saying, literally Christ says, it's better for you to be the millstone and be thrown into the sea and be forgotten than it is to cause anybody to sin. And the same picture is being displayed here for Babylon. Babylon caused people to sin. It led them into debauchery. It led them into a place of sinfulness and sinful nature. And God is being the judge on that. God is saying that he has thrown them like a millstone that they will be forgotten that there will be uh, no more trumpets being played, no more craftsmen, no more sound, no more light, no more voices, no more anything. It will be destroyed in every way. And, and I love the fact that it says a day, because as we talked about last week with the bowls of God's wrath, there's a presumed assumption that, it, it, that all of that will happen in a day. That that action of the bowls of God's wrath is being poured out on evil who we've talked about, the mark of the beast, those who had the mark of the beast, it seemed like it was all poured out on them. That could be that this is the culmination of that picture, that these kind of overlap, that this is almost the poetic view of what happened in chapter 16. Um, I'm not going to hang my hat on that. I believe that, but I'm not, I'm not saying that this is absolute. However, there is a direct correlation to the wrath, the day of the wrath of the Lord that we see in Scripture fulfilled in chapter 16 and being showcased here in chapter 18, where it literally says that all this will happen in a day. It will be laid waste in a day. Yes, sir? When I first read this, I thought they were talking about the city of Babylon. And then what I like to talk about is Rome. So, yes. So, it, essentially, we bring connotation to it. it. The further you read in commentaries, you're going to find people say it's America. Yeah, I was going to say, is it, it could be futuristic. 
Very much so. Yeah. It's, but just like they would call people, uh, like, like I said before, uh, like we say certain people are Nazis, right? They're not actually Nazis. They might carry disgraceful actions of who they are, and so we just label them that, right? Or like I said before, left wing or right wing nuts, right? And so like we categorize people in the same way. The, the, the way that Babylon is used in scriptures is like a, an umbrella picture of evil. And so anybody who is the enemy of God and God's people is from Babylon. And so I personally believe that this isn't necessarily a nation. I think this is more towards our uh, creation of what we call Satan, right? That there is an entity that has tried to overthrow God, that has tried to come against God. In some depictions, he's the dragon. In some depictions, he's other things. But he has a place of prominence, of power, and deception. And, I mean, when you get down to it, like, to be able to have all this trade happening and all of these things going on, you have to be in a pretty powerful place. And it doesn't mean there has to be one nation, though. So Rome is a, is a decent picture of that. I think America is a decent picture of that. Uh, Iran, Iraq, you get down into brass tacks, you could kind of say any nation that hoards money and then doesn't utilize it in a generous way, I think there's, there's an act, and, and not to mention the, the sexual immorality that, I mean, the, the most valuable thing on the internet currently is pornography. It makes more money than all of our professional sports combined. Yes. And so like to, to say that, you know, Hollywood is not a part of this would be, I think would be a misnomer, but like, I, I still think that this is a picture of an entity of sorts with the judgment being poured out on them and their followers. I like the way you say because Babylon, because if you study Babylon and the way the Bible talks about Babylon, you said it will be destroyed. Could you call those guys the bad guys, the Nazis? Because he said that Babylon will never be built upon. Yes. And it's out of Baghdad, I watched a documentary on that not too long ago, where they went to the town of Babylon. And it's completely destroyed. It's never been built on. Yep. There's wild animals there. It's totally crazy. Yeah. And they built the city all around it. But yep. where the actual town was, the old footage is still... It's yeah, still decimated. decimated. Yeah. And, and there's, oh. there's some rebuilds that Saddam Hussein did, and then he yeah. built himself a house on yeah. it. And so, yeah. yeah. But the, the, still the characterization of that is, is still very true. So they're the bad guys of... Exactly. They're, they're, they're the, you know, the, the ninjas of, of, yeah, I can't say ninjas. Ninjas are cool. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So, so that's kind of Babylon is, is the negative, and this is the judgment being poured out on Babylon. Um, but it continues in 19 as a picture back towards a rejoicing of what is happening towards evil, not just Babylon, the city. Um, but is there any other questions or... I'm going fast, I know, but I just want to make sure we get everything in order. Okay, uh, so 19, uh, can somebody read verses 1 through 10 for me? After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, and he has judged the great prostitutes. Who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants? Once more they cried out, Hallelujah. The smoke from, from her rose up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you, all you his servants. You who fear him, great and small. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a giant, of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, "Hallelujah! For, for, for the Lord God, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her." to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who have, who hold the, 
the who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. prophecy. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, just real quick. The, at the very end, he says, to those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. It's the same picture going back to who the devil is going to attack, who the dragon is going to attack, to those who cling to the testimony. It's the same picture that goes to that, the second 144,000. And so you see this connection that it's not just 144,000. Even John, who is seeing this vision, is a part of that depiction, those who part of the testimony of Christ. And so it essentially makes it a bigger picture on display. I wanted to highlight that because I'm not going to touch on it after. Uh, but anyways, uh, uh, so there's a, a lot that we can unpack here, but there's, there's one thing that I really want to highlight. Um, and that is that there are three hallelujahs that are being proclaimed. Um, the first hallelujah that we see uh, is in verse one, and it's a hallelujah of salvation. It's a hallelujah of, of salvation, of glory, and of power, and, and this judgment that God is bringing about and pouring out on his enemy because we are essentially praising God for what he has done. He is paying back those who have martyred his people and, and paying back those who, uh, who really has tortured uh, the, the believers. Um, and, and so this is a, pi a picture of a praise of salvation and essentially, this is a hallelujah praise of the fulfillment of God's promises, um, his promises and his prophecy. Right. Remember at the very beginning in, in chapter uh, four, I think five, maybe somewhere in there, the, the, the crowd, the great multitude before him says, when are you going to avenge us? And these are the people that it says, these are the ones who have been martyred for their faith. When will you avenge us, God? And he says, I will avenge you when it's time. I will, I will take that duty on. So when the final one who's been martyred is martyred, then I will avenge you. And so this is the depiction of the finality of God's promise. It's kind of like he says throughout scripture multiple times. Don't try and fight back against your enemy. Let God take care of that. Right. And this is God fulfilling his promises. And so this is a praise or a hallelujah of God's salvation, his glory, his power, ultimately the fulfillment of his promises. Um, the second hallelujah that we see is that, that the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And we don't really have a smoke offering. I know that sounds weird. Maybe my cigars when I smoke is a smoke offering. I don't know. <laughs> But we don't have a, a smoke offering. But if you go into some of the Eastern cultures, um, like Taoism, uh, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, they have these incense that they light and they burn. Uh, sometimes uh, 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 it's done in front of pictures of, of people who have passed away. And it's these incense where the smoke goes up as an offering to God. Sometimes they burn money and then that smoke turns into money in heaven for them. That was a fun thing to learn in China. I saw people burning money and I'm like, what is going on? But this was an offering to their family who have passed away to have money in the afterlife. But this concept of a smoke offering is not new. This is a concept that was very prominent to the Jewish people. <clears throat> and so the, the beautiful picture that's being displayed here is that God's the offering to God that will last forever is the smoke of his enemy's destruction, right? That, that, that nobody can conquer God. And so for eternity, that smoke that goes up as an offering is an offering of praise because he is the one true God. He is the God almighty to be worshiped. And so this destruction that is being seen ultimately is a picture of praise. Um, you see it in Revelation where we talk about the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever as an offering. Um, Isaiah 34 talks about the smoke of their destruction will go up forever and ever. And then Deuteronomy 29, uh, Moses highlights Sodom, Gomorrah, Adama, and Zeobim, which are nation states, people groups that were ultimately destroyed by God. And all of that smoke becomes an offering. So as, as you said earlier, this picture of Babylon being laid waste is, is essentially an offering to God showing him that he is the God of creation, the God of destruction, because you can look and it's still a wasteland. So God is powerful enough to, to essentially allow that to be the case forever. So when God says something is destroyed, it's gone forever. And so I, I think it's really cool. It kind of showcases his power and his authority 
ultimately so that we can see that final third picture. Uh, this third hallelujah, that he is reigning as king. Um, this one is, it, it's, it's amazing because it showcases who he truly is, right? Right now we've got the people who were martyred before the throne who are sitting there praising him. We have the 24 elders, the four living creatures coming back into the scene that we saw in chapter one and chapter two. And then we are ultimately greeted with this picture of the great multitude again. <clears throat> this great multitude from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, this great multitude that we've seen over and over and over again, coming, praising God again for the finality of what he offers, that he is the one true God, that he is the king of kings. Um, and ultimately, ending with this picture of the... Uh, marriage Supper to the Lamb. Now, how many of you know what the Marriage Supper of the Lamb is? Have you ever heard of that before? Okay, so the Marriage Supper of the Lamb is essentially a picture of uh, the finality of our unity as believers with God. So, so when we talk about uh, being engrafted into the fold, we talk about being saved. We talk about becoming a part of the family of God. That, that God now has given us his Holy Spirit so that we are sealed ultimately on this earth so that when we get to heaven, we have the opportunity to be a part of the actual family of God. We become married in or adopted in, in that way. And so this is imagery that's, that's used quite often, not necessarily as the marriage supper of the lamb. Uh, the marriage supper of the lamb is only found in two places, Three places and roughly one of those is a parable. Um, and so it could be, could not be kind of thing. But what it is, is it's a final depiction of the unity of Christ and his bride, the church. And so that's what the picture is that Christ portrays. And he says that, that the church has become the bride of Christ. And that we are to live in a righteous way. We are to live in a good way. Ultimately, that we see here of these deeds, uh, the linen clothing that we are able to bring. Um, there is a group of, of belief that, uh, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, it's a belief that uh, essentially you, uh, you do good things, you get rewarded for those things, and then ultimately they become an offering to God. Um, and this, this, this is one of the three ways to show that we love God. Um, it's, I can't, oh man, I can't remember what it's called, but, uh, essentially we're, we're by those good deeds, by the rewards, this is a system with which we can honor God, um, by fear and by love are the other two. These are the three ways that we show our devotion to God in the scriptures. One is you do good works, you can get good things happen to you either here on this earth or in the future, right? Uh, the other one is that you fear God enough that you will be devoted to him. Fear in a reverence way, not in a scared way. Or you, that you love him enough that you're so overcome by love for him that you're willing to do what it takes to showcase his love. So in that, there is an aspect that people will do these certain good deeds and will tell you that when you thank them, don't take my reward away from me. Have you ever heard that before? I had, I had a person tell me that one time that they, they did something very nice for me. And I went up to him, I shook their hand. I said, thank you so much for doing that. And he said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't take that reward away from me. And it's like, well, I can say thank you. It's not like God's keeping a tally. And he's like, no, oh, no, Fozzie said, thank you. Get that reward back here. Like it's, it's not the point, right? The point is, is what this is being displayed. It says that it was granted for her, the bride of Christ, the church, those who trust in the testimony of God, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. It is our honor to work and live in such a way that we can bless others so that ultimately we don't get to showcase ourselves, but we get to honor God even more in the kingdom with brighter clothes. That's not a literal, this is still a figurative example, but that's still our motivation is that 
we get to go home to God and God literally look at us and say, thank you for doing what you did. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's, that's the idea. Not that we get the well done, but that that well done is, a, is an overflow of God's love towards us because we were devoted to him. And so this is that clothing that we can wear, the deeds that we do. Uh, it's not that this can be taken away from you. This is still the righteous acts of the saints. These are the good deeds that we're able to do towards others. Um, and there's this weird line that uh, I want to hit on real quick. It says in verse 9, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who do you think that is? Who do you think wasn't invited? Huh? Unbelievers? Okay. But yeah, they're gone now, right? <laughs> so, so there's argument about this verse. Um, and most of the argument comes from a, a certain group of people who believe that we as the church are completely separate from Israel as the, the people of God. And so we have replaced, it's called replacement theology, that we have replaced Israel as the church. And so in this depiction, their belief is that in a wedding, a wedding has to have witnesses. And to an extent, in the ancient times, a wedding did have to have witnesses. It was completely different than how we do weddings and what we would consider a witness. But there's, you can kind of run along that track. But they believe that the people who are invited are the believers who have put their faith in God, the testimony of Christ, and that those who are uninvited are the Jews, the witnesses to the wedding. Now, here's the downfall to that. If we are saved by faith, looking back, couldn't they be saved by faith looking forward? See, one of the biggest questions that I get asked is, what, what, is, what, what happened to the Old Testament people? Who, were they ever saved? Could they ever be saved? And the answer is, absolutely. They just had to have more faith, in my opinion, that God was going to send a Messiah, that God was faithful enough to judge them in righteousness the way that he talks about. That's why when you get into the book of Hebrews, you see people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of them being counted as righteous because they were saved by the same faith in God that we have. We just have the gifting to be able to even look back on it historically and say, that's the proof of my salvation is the blood of Christ being poured out. So salvation has always existed because Christ's blood is paid for eternal past, eternal present, and eternal future. His blood is sufficient enough for it all. And so I don't think that this would be a picture or a depiction of people who are the Jews to separate ourselves. I think that replacement theology is incredibly wrong um, because it, there's no real biblical foundation for it. I think that the church has been engrafted in like the scripture says. And, and so these people are probably just believers. Anybody who has put their faith in God, who have, who have trusted in God enough to know that even if they couldn't call his name, that they knew he was coming. That's the same faith in us knowing his name and looking back. Um, so I think that there's a valuable picture uh, being showcased there, but not to over... You, you can dig into every word and every verse and you could find a ton of different things to discuss and talk about. Um, but yeah, so, so that's that little section there. Is there any questions on that? Comments, heresy, eggs, or... So it's a completely different set of circumstances before Jesus, right? Not necessarily. Well, I mean, for uh, like saying like Abraham and his faith and belief in God is like he's judged under different circumstances because the Messiah hasn't come yet. Well, he would he well the judgment still hasn't happened yet. So that's the key to remember. We'll get there in chapter twenty. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment, but the judgment hasn't happened yet. They, they don't. They've already passed on. And, but, but the kicker is, and this is what a, a lot of people get really hung up on. Our 
understanding of salvation and how we portray it, how we speak it, how we read it and understand it is to say that, that we have placed our faith in the saving grace of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Okay. But the faith factor is still in God, right? Because Jesus is God. He is one third of the Trinity. So when we place our faith in God, we have identified him because of what his sacrifice was as Christ. They still place their faith in God, in Yahweh, living in devotion, living in righteousness to the law of what God called them to, knowing that they couldn't fulfill it so he would have to send his son. But Christ's life and his blood was sufficient enough to cover all people who have placed their faith in. Ultimately, we will see in this judgment, uh, the great white throne judgment, this aspect of, of, of who's judged where and how and all of that stuff. And there, there's a, a godly, meticulous nature that he will use that we don't have a clue about. Um, but he gives us a little information on. So we'll get there and I'll, I'll try and highlight that. Or if I, if I don't, just raise your hand and remind me of it because I want to talk about that. Um, but yeah, is there any other? Yeah. Yes, sir? Abraham and that era was before the law. True. Very true. Uh, but you can even go back even further with, I, or with yeah. uh, Cain and Abel, right? Yeah. They're still making offerings. Right. And so... The law was a picture of still devotion to God. Yeah. Now, God identified it further through Moses and through the writings and the teachings. But ultimately, faith is what saves us. Because if obedience saves us, we're all screwed. Uh, <laughs> you might be good enough, but I'm sure not. Uh, but anyway, so can somebody read for uh, any other questions? I'm sorry. Okay. Can anybody read for us verses 11 through 21? Boom. So you want to go to the great supper of the lamb, not the great supper of God. It's the great supper of God is gorging on the flesh of kings, captains, mighty. Oh, that's nasty. But anyways, uh, that's a bad, <laughs> it's a smorgasbord of evil. Um, but all right, as we jump into that, who first, who do you think the rider on the white horse is? Jesus. Right. That's that's that is probably the most 100 percent assumption here. But the reason that we make that assumption is because, like I talked about before, in understanding prophecy, we have to realize that prophets and God uses imagery as tools. Every description of this writer is an imagery being displayed, which we took, inferred, understood, and then came to a conclusion. So the, the author used the same imagery as a tool for us to understand. This is how we need to interpret scripture as well. When we are looking at the beast with the 10 heads and the crowns and the seven and the blah, 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 like all of that is the same reality. All that is the same imagery being used. It's just that this is so much easier to understand, right? But let's, let's solidify if this is Jesus or not, okay? So first... First thing that it says that this writer is, is that he is faithful and true. It uses two terms here. Uh, the first term is the Greek term aletheia. 
uh, which is, it carries the meaning faithful, truthful, true, um, but it is a spiritual truth being talked about. It's a depiction of a spiritual truth. Jesus uses this term in John 14, 6, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says aletheia there. Uh, a second time in John 8, 32, he says, uh, you, uh, then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So this picture is a spiritual truth that you will know that he is our spiritual truth. The second picture is pistos, which pistos is a Greek word meaning truth, trustworthy, faithful, but in a physical concept or context that he is physically truthful. He is physically faithful. He's somebody that is trustworthy. And so it's showcasing that this person on this white horse is true in both spiritual walk and in a physical walk. So does that check Jesus for us? Fairly so. Yeah, right. Fairly easy to, to, to kind of jump to that conclusion. The second thing it says is that he judges in righteousness. Now, one of the things that, that we don't like as Christians, because we're we're in this age of lovey-dovey, is we don't like the term that God judges. Um, but God judges. But he judges in a way that is righteous. And as we see through the book of John, Jesus is told by God and tells uh, his disciples that he will be the judge. That it's Essentially, judgment comes through him. Ultimately, it's a picture of the judgment coming through him because of his blood and his sacrifice. But that he will be the judge. And this judgment is based off of the first picture, faithful and true, both the truth spiritually and physically, because the Pharisees for so many times, essentially this is why Jesus called them whitewashed tombs is because they were willing to physically cause themselves even pain in order to be righteous, to obey the law. But their insides were dark and destroyed. Interior wise, their spiritual life was awful. And Jesus highlighted this multiple times in showcasing to them that you're only halfway there. He's like, oh, good. You, you haven't committed adultery. You haven't cheated on your spouse. That's neat. But have you lusted after somebody else? If so, then guess what? You failed there. Oh, you haven't committed murder? Neat. Have you ever hated somebody? Because if you did, now that shows the spiritual side of it that you have, you have rot inside of you. You have sinned inside of you. And so this picture of both a spiritual truth and a physical truth is God showcasing that he judges in righteousness. Ultimately, Christ is the fulfillment of Psalm 9, 8, where he says that he judges the world with righteousness. He judges people with uprightness. And so ultimately we see that his judgment of righteousness and in righteousness would be a classification of Christ, right? So we can kind of check that box off as well. Christ is the only one who is perfect and can judge in righteousness, right? Third depiction, he makes war. Again, just to make people mad. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but if the outcome of righteous judgment is making war, then is war all bad? Can war be good sometimes? Yeah. I mean, e even in the reality of death, and, and struggle and strain. Like, this is why we've misunderstood Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future and a purpose. He's not talking to each individual. He's talking to Israel as a whole. I mean, if, 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 if we had to and we could ask God and be like, hey, could you interpret that further? He'd be like, yes, yeah, some of you are going to have to die. Some of you are going to struggle. Some of you are going to go be enslaved. Some of you are going to be destroyed. But ultimately... Israel as a whole will exist and go further. But sometimes some people have to go through hardship. Sometimes some people have to go to war. And sometimes, whether we like it or not, and it's, and it's atrocious and you would never want it to happen, but sometimes there are casualties that happen in war that are not necessary, but they happen. To, to, to mark it all off as bad and to try and think that we could live in this utopia of peace is just a complete misnomer because even God utilizes war because sometimes it is necessary. And in this time, he is making war against evil. Jesus said this, and this is one of my favorite quotes of Jesus, so don't come at me. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, her mother and, and daughter-in-law and mother-in-law and all of this stuff. It's not that God is saying, I've come to bring 
you know, give, give the son a sword so he can kill his dad. It's, he's saying, I want my people to follow me, even if it means that they have to cut off their family ties. I did not come to make everybody love you. He said, John 16, in this world, you will have problems. You will have troubles. Take heart. I have overcome the world. We're promised not fluffy, lovey-dovey, everything's great. We live in such a comfortable community, society, and culture that, that we are so ready and willing to attack other people and other cultures for defending themselves or, in, or, being, or fighting over things. We're, we're willing to interject ourselves because we don't know what that looks like. So we think we know what's right because we live in peace. Well, that's malarkey. Because there's hundreds and thousands of people who have gone to war before so that we could have that comfort. And so we are just in this weird place where we don't fully grasp and understand what it means or what it costs to actually be a believer. To be a believer costs us our life. But we have a luxury that it doesn't actually cost us anything. Uh, There's a quote... um, I don't quote much from Martin Luther, but there's a quote by Martin Luther. Uh, He says, the greatest tactic the devil ever used for the church was for him to attack the church. Because in attacking the church, essentially it solidified and gave strength to those who believe in God. It's in struggle, in strain that our faith actually grows. In comfort, it's weak. And so this is a picture of that war that is going to come about, this picture of war that God showcases and he brings judgment towards. Um, so again, I think that's another check for Christ. Um, even he said he, didn't, he came to bring a sword. Baller. Uh, he's got a sword later on in here. But anyways, uh, the, sec- the next thing we see is he's got eyes like flames. Now there's only three places in scripture where we see eyes like flames. In Daniel chapter 10, uh, in Revelation 1 and then here in Revelation 19. And, and so the, the depiction is hard to get a grasp on what it means for eyes like flames. So if you look in the culture and in context of the cultures around them, you see that Baal has eyes like flames. Ra, or from the Ugaritic, uh, Ugaritic text, Ra has eyes like flames uh, from the Egyptians. Uh, Shemesh from Mesopotamia and Ishtar from Mesopotamia, all of them have eyes like flames. And the use of their eyes like flames is a picture of judgment. That their flames burn through the chaff surrounding the person and the fake good deeds that they have to see the real person underneath. And so again, this picture of eyes like flames could be considered in the cultural context of this rider on the white horse being able to see through the deeds of people, some good, some bad, some pretend to be able to see the real person underneath and to be able to bring about judgment on them. Um, Again, I think that is a picture of Christ. So let's continue to check. I mean, do you disagree? You you want to argue? I like it. (laughs) Just kidding. Uh, Anyway, so, so yeah, so we've got, we got eyes like flames. Next thing we see is many crowns. Like we've talked about before, with the beasts and, and the different depictions and imagery. Many crowns on the heads usually has these pictures of kingdoms, right? But if one entity is wearing multiple crowns, that would kind of symbolize that they are kind of a king of kings, right? That they carry the weight of multiple kingdoms on the singular head of themselves. So this picture of many crowns, again, it's probably a picture of, of who we've seen as the king of kings, lord of lords. Again, check towards Jesus. Um, Then we see a picture of an unknown name. Um, For some reason, I have been obsessed in my life with understanding names in scripture. And so, like I've talked about many times before, uh, a name was extremely valuable. Uh, We think money is a good inheritance, but the scripture says that money doesn't matter. Money comes and goes. You could be rich and literally lose it all in a day. Money doesn't matter. What can you leave behind as inheritance for your kids, for your generations, is a good name. Because a good name carries more context, carries more power, carries more influence. Money is worthless, but a good name is to be praised. We see it in Proverbs 22.1, Proverbs 10.7, Proverbs 15.30, and Ecclesiastes 7.1. Is this picture of a good name. Well, how much, how 
better can a name be if nobody has ever had the right or the opportunity to degrade it? So an unknown name is better than any name because nobody's had an opportunity to shame that name, to degrade that name in any way, or to tear it down in any way. And so this picture of an unknown name is a picture of essentially a perfect lineage, a perfect generation, a perfect inheritance that we soon, if, if, if this is Jesus, that we soon will become a part of, that you also see back in the churches, when the churches were being discussed in chapter two and three, uh, or three and four, of a good name. That if you endure, you will receive a new name. This name is the same name that we can assume is being showcased here as the unknown name. So, this name, unknown name, perfect in genealogy, perfect in lineage, perfect in every way, I think that could be considered uh, pointing towards Christ again. Um, then we get back into the, the army aspect, right? The military aspect that he's clothed in blood. Um, I've never seen a depiction of Jesus clothed in blood. I, I've, I've never seen a Jesus with the right skin color probably either. But most of them are very white, um, light skin, light hair. But I think that that would be a bad to the bone painting of Jesus on a white horse and like just balling out and like, Covered in, well, the picture of covered in blood is, is a cultural description of a powerful warrior. Essentially, if a warrior came home covered in blood and none of it was their own, they were the perfect soldier because they weren't harmed in any way, but they destroyed everyone around them. It's essentially, uh, this is a thing in uh, Vietnam that my dad would tell me about, that they would take the tags, the dog tags off of the Viet Cong after they had fought with them. Now, some used it as trophies, while others used it as an opportunity to actually send it back to Vietnam after the war and like kind of give families closure. But, but the same picture is kind of there. The more dog tags you had, the more people that you conquered, the more people that you killed. The same here. The more blood-stained you were, the better powerful soldier that you were because you, none of that blood was yours. It was all a part of your essentially conquering. Um, this, again, is a picture kind of that the, the, the uh, wine stain of God's wrath in, Psalm, or in Isaiah 63, where he goes in the wine press of God's wrath. And so the wine splashes up, the blood splashes up on them. This is kind of a depiction that would, would go along with that. Um, so clothed in blood. And then finally, the coup de grace. Called by the name word of God. So here's the kicker. John wrote the, the book of Revelation and the gospel of John and John 1, 2, and 3 at some point in his life. Some will argue that he wrote Revelation first and then the gospel second and then the books third. Some say that it was all intertwined and mixed. Some say that he wrote it at the same time. In any sense, does not really matter. All that really matters is that we see connections between the two. You can understand the revelation better by reading the gospel of John. You will make connections and see connections that he uses. You can also understand revelation better by reading the prophets who John was skilled with. He, he, was, he was a scholar in knowing that stuff. So he utilized what he had, the tools that he had, the imagery that was given to him, and he wrote it down in a way that would connect the dots. Well, John connects one of the biggest dots here by starting his gospel off saying that Jesus was the word of God. It says in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then in verse 14, it says that Jesus is the word of God. This is, this is who John was highlighting. This is who John is showcasing. And so when John says that he is called by name, word of God, he is saying without a doubt, and I think, again, this is an imagery as tools for us to understand that this rider on the white horse is Christ himself, because ultimately the capstone is that he, the rider, is the word of God. And so we can cling to that notion, that thought that we had from the beginning as we took all these imagery, images together and put them together. We said, this is God or this is Christ himself. And lo and behold, it is. Um, and so, yes. So, any questions real quick before we kind of finish that one out? Well, the robe dipped in blood, what about his crucifixion? 
very much could be... Most of the time when it talks about blood, it's either blood of God or blood of the enemies, right? It's either Christ's sacrifice of blood or blood of the enemies. And so I think that you could use a lot of imagery there for sure um, in making and connecting those dots. Um, uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, so ultimately we see these armies following. Uh, a lot of people debate whether we are a part of that army. Um, you know, are we the people with in linen and white horses? I, maybe. I don't know. I don't think it really matters. Um, we see in Revelation 17, Christ's fighting alone. Isaiah 63, Christ fights alone. And Isaiah 25, or Matthew 25, angels fight, with, uh, fight alongside of Christ. And then in 2 Thessalonians 1, Christ fights alone. So maybe, or it could be angels, could be, you know, instead of David's mighty men, it's Jesus' mighty men, and they're all coming and, you know, riding on horses. I don't know. I, I, well, yes, sir? If you, had, if you haven't had the rapture, if there is one, yep. or they haven't brought the dead back for judgment yet, yet. This is then a, it shouldn't be us. I, I would fully agree. You, there's a lot of things that have dominoes that have to fall in place for that to be yeah. the case. I, I fully agree. Um, but yeah, so I, I think it's probably angels. I don't think Jesus needs help. He seems pretty baller on here anyway. <laughs> um, so he has this double-edged sword. Again, this is another depiction of the word of God. Uh, we see it in multiple times in scripture. Uh, iron rod, we see in Psalm 2.9, uh, where... where um, Christ showcases that, uh, that he will dash the enemies with an iron rod and he will rule the nations. Um, so this is a fulfillment of prophecy uh, in Psalm 2.9. Um, and then we see the winepress of his wrath again, this pointing back towards the judgment. Um, then there says this on his thighs written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Um, I have had multiple people tell me that this is their reason to get a tattoo, that this was written on his thigh. And it's like, come on. Uh, this is not, if that's your justification of the tattoo, cool. It's not necessarily right. Uh, I think that this has more of cultural connotation rather than a tattoo connotation. Um, that people, when they fought for their king, they would write their king's name down their thigh and on their chest. This is, or they would carry their flag or the image of the, of the family crest on their thigh or on their chest. And so to, to say that, I mean, he, this is Jesus fighting for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's fighting for God. So I think it's more necessary to think that this is a picture of power and him as a soldier, not necessarily um, getting a tattoo. But if Jesus had a tattoo, maybe it says King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Um, you don't quote me on that. Uh, so then we see this, this angel's call to, to, to the birds, you know, the feasts of death, I called it. Um, Death of the come feasts on the death of the kings, the captains, mighty men, horses, riders, all men, slave free, great and small. Um, this is a fulfillment of prophecy that we see in Ezekiel and in Isaiah, um, showcasing that those who oppressed God and his people uh, ultimately would be destroyed by being eaten. Um, uh, no, I, I think. I think it's more imagery than reality. And so uh, a lot of cultures believe that like your bones have to be buried together. The Jews believe heavily that your bones have to be buried together. Um, in fact, little known fact, uh, the skull and crossbones that you see on the pirates uh, flag is actually a Jewish picture um, because uh, when a burial happens and it, they disintegrate enough, I think it's after three years, they go in, they collect the bones, but the bones in the ossuary the thigh bones were too big to set long wise. So they crossed them and they put the skull on top. And so the Jews utilized the skull and crossbones as a picture of death. Pirates took it over as a depiction that they utilized later. But essentially they believed that all bones had to be together. And so to have birds eat you and separate your body into different areas, your resurrection of sorts or any kind of belief that you would come back in an afterlife wouldn't be a part of it. Egyptians have the same thing. That's why they mummified bodies and stuff like that. Um, so I think it's more of a tormented future picture for them rather than a literal, like you, you won't be able to be resurrected because the birds will eat you and destroy you and separate you. Um, 
lots of fun on that conversation. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so let's get into uh, chapter 20. Let me read it real quick because there's a, there's a couple of things that I really want to highlight. Um, chapter 20, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit, shut and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those who had the authority to judge uh, was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not uh, worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, uh, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life again until the thousand years had ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and, whole, um, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years had ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like, a thousand, uh, like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire of sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then I saw a great white throne <coughs> and him who was seated on it. From his presence, the earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. The sea had given up their dead uh, who were in it. Death and Hades had given up their dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, the second death, uh, uh, the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so a lot to unpack here. First, uh, millennial reign. There is a, uh, a belief here of, of a possibility of a thousand year reign. Um, Satan is bound, right? The, 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 the two beasts are thrown into the bottomless pit which isn't death or Hades, because that's later thrown back in there with them. Um, but the dragon is, is, or they're thrown into the lake of fire. The dragon is bound by a chain and then thrown into a bottomless pit and then sealed. Okay, so, so for, for, for some reason, for another time. And then there's this belief of a, of a millennial reign, a thousand year reign, where the dragon does not exist, has no influence uh, on the world. And, and there's a couple of, of beliefs of it. There's not a lot of historical evidence of thousand years. Um, there's a couple of things throughout history that you can kind of connect the dots to um, from like Sabbath year calculations where, you know, every seven days is, of course, uh, uh, Sabbath rest. And then every seven years is something and every 70 years and every uh, 700. No, it's not 700 years. Now you got year of Jubilee and different things like that. And so all of these calculations on the Jewish cal calendar create what they call a Sabbath year calculations. Um, and rabbinical sources believe that, that once the world or once the Torah was written, that we would have 6,000 years of following the law, <clears throat> including Christ's time and, and all of that stuff. And then that there would be a thousand year Shabbat or a thousand year reign of, of rest. Um, so they believe that this could possibly be that connection. Um, in either way, I, I, thousand years, you know, scripture says a thousand years like a day and a day like a thousand years to, to, to chalk that up as an exact number. Cool. You can, I, I if, if, if you want to, I don't think it's a negative. I don't think there's any negative connotation to believing it in that way. Um, but it's, it's powerful nonetheless, because there's, a, a reason that this thousand years exists, and it's to pull Satan's influence away from the world. Some believe, there's, there's kind of two beliefs on it. One, that it's just to showcase God, to showcase to people that they're sinful and awful, and they don't even need the temptation of Satan. 
They're just sinful. But we already know that. That we don't need help with that. We know we know we're awful. Yeah, we blame Satan on a lot of things that we're being attacked or whatever, but but like we're awful humans. That's that's a part of it. We got that. I think the other aspect is again, like we have seen continually, is to allow more people the opportunity of grace. To allow more people to not be influenced by the deception, which is why he was thrown in there, of the enemy but instead be enlightened and have rest in God and so that they can put their faith and hope and trust in God. And so I think that's the reason of this time frame, whether it is a thousand years or not. Um, because there's three people that are highlighted in it. The first per people that are highlighted is the nations. Um, and, and the nations must continue to exist because if it's only the resurrected, how are they then deceived later? Right? So, so, so it can't be the resurrected that only exist. Has to be the nations still exist. Because the other ones are dead. They've already been judged, right? The wrath has been poured out. So, so, so you have three options. You have the nations, you have the dead who are raised, and the dead who will be raised later. So the nations have to continue to exist. And so again, like I've said, this is the three separations that you see in Jewish uh, uh, rabbinical teaching is those who didn't choose God or Satan, those who chose Satan and those who chose God. And so you see the same three being put on display here. Um, you'll also see the nations later on that we'll talk about in chapter 22. Um, but I changed some of the verbiage a, a little bit to kind of uh, better understand it. My translation says that they had been beheaded, uh, that they came to life again, um, and something else. Um, and this, this is how I change it. If you go back to verse four, <clears throat> it says that the souls of those who had been beheaded, that word there actually just means cut off, that their life was cut off. Now, in certain instances, it does mean beheaded. But here it seems more to indicate those who, because like, think about it, how many people in history have been beheaded compared to how many people have been cut off for their faith in God? The martyrs before the throne weren't just martyrs who had been beheaded. They were martyrs for their faith in however they were tortured, right? Peter crucified upside down at low tide so that he, wasn't Peter crucified upside down at low tide? Yeah, so that he drowned to death, right? He didn't get his head chopped off. And so I think it's more of those whose life was cut off. I think that's a better interpretation. So the souls of those whose life had been cut off for their testimony of Christ or of Jesus and the word of God would be a part of this resurrection. And then I included myself, I included and also those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark uh, on their foreheads because they lived and reigned with Christ forever or for that thousand years, instead of came to, that term there just means continued. So it's not that they were raised back to life there, that they had continued to live. So we have both those who are resurrected, who believe in Christ, and those who remained alive as the nations. And so I think in the interpretive process, that the theology of, of people in, who are writing the ESV essentially inferred their beliefs on accident in it because both of those terms are not outlandish terms to change. It's just, it's a slight variance in how it's articulated, not in how it's written. And so I would, I would make the claim and believe that it showcases the three, that the nations remain alive, that the dead are raised of the first resurrection, those who believed and put their faith in Christ. And then ultimately the dead will be raised later that second resurrection. Um, so blessed is the first resurrection, again, because those are the people who have put their faith um, in Christ. Um, and then watch out for the second death, which we'll see here in just a second. But we're interrupted here with the defeat of Satan. And I think, I think that this is not another defeat of Satan in as much as it is a defeat of Satan from a different view. Right? If we all went to see a movie... And we came back and wrote a description of that movie, the highlights, the climax, the, the ins and outs, the ups and downs of the movie. Every one of our descriptions would be different. And so I think that the, the best way to, to see prophecy is not to see it in a linear order, 
but to see it as a bunch of pictures that continually overlap each other. Um, now, that is not a perfect rendition. This could be, and I'm not saying that it's not, but this could be a, a finality, a third attempt by Satan to overthrow God. The, the only reason that I don't truly put my heart into to saying that that's the case is that there's multiple times that it says that Satan will get a chance and that ultimately in that chance, he will only have a short time. And so if we're counting, this is like the fifth chance. And so I think some of them overlaid. Maybe this is the second chance and then the rest kind of overlaid themselves. But ultimately, the final act is he goes and he deceives to recruit nations to him. Again, these nations have to exist because it's not the spiritual believers who are resurrected who get deceived. So these nations exist, are called in. This is, again, it's Gog and Magog, this picture of Harmageddon, the, the, the valley of Megiddo, where this battle might take place, or at least it has a connection to. Um, but ultimately, an act of God comes and destroys it all. The same picture we see in, uh, with Ezekiel, nope, with Elijah on Mount Carmel, where he calls down fire from heaven and it destroys the altar. And then he goes and he kills all of the prophets of Baal. This is kind of that same thing that fire comes down and consumes them because they've surrounded his people, the saints. Um, so yeah, so big interruption of Satan's destruction, but then we get to the great white throne judgment. But do we have, you have yeah, a question? How does, how does Satan get all this power if Christ is still on earth? <laughs> well, this is again, God allows Right. For this moment, we know that he took Satan off of this earth, yeah. which, again, the, Scripture's hard. OK, because there's two other places that it says that Satan is bound. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's a belief because uh, I think it's in Isaiah and Ezekiel that Satan is currently bound, that he has no influence over us. But somehow at some point, God releases him and then he goes and he deceives and then God attacks and destroys. But then he goes and he deceives and he attacks and destroys. And so either these are pictures that overlay or God is, is continually giving chances. To what end, to what reason? I don't know. He's God and I'm not. Um, but in the end, every one of them culminates in the exact same depiction. He, he's got nothing on God. Like we have this tendency to counter Satan with God as, as a one-to-one -one ratio, and it is a one-to-none ratio. Like, he is created by God, and so he has no power. He can be in one place at one time, in, you know, influencing one person. And I'm sorry, I'm not that special. So I'm not worth, maybe a demon might influence me or try and come and attack me, but I'm not that special to be pinpointed by, you know, the bad almighty or whatever, you know, some people call him. But, but yeah, I... I don't know why he gets all these opportunities. Um, he gets squashed every time, so he should just throw in the towel. Or if he's reading this, he should throw it in beforehand because it ain't going to work. Uh, so finally, we get to the great white throne judgment. This is, this is one of my absolute favorites um, to, to really study. Um, there's, it, as with everything in Scripture, there's so much debate over it. Um, but... The great white throne judgment, the first thing that you see is that the earth and sky fled. And I absolutely love this because it gives a depiction and a description of the power of God. And the reason that I say that is because Moses, when Moses finally talked to God into allowing him to see him, God hit him in a cleft in a rock. And it says that he passed by in his essence, his smell, the, the after effect of God being in the presence of him was the residual effect that Moses was able to see and that caused him to glow. So much so that when he went down, he was glowing and people were terrified of him. So they asked him to cover his face because he was glowing too much. Okay, that's the power of God by his aroma being left behind. So when God finally steps foot on this earth in his power of, and authority as king, the earth and sky flee from his presence. That's powerful. That's not literal, but that is, that is imagery at its best. That God in his glory steps foot on here and the sinfulness of the earth and the sinfulness of the sky, which is the heavens, flees from his presence because of how powerful and mighty our God is. Like, oh, just 
invigorates you. Um, and so this is where we begin to see the second resurrection happen, okay? This is the second resurrection. It says where all of all people raised from the sea and death and Hades all gave up their dead and the oceans gave up their dead and everybody came and ultimately for this final great white throne judgment. This is what God, uh, Christ talked about with the sheep and the goats. In his, in his parable of the sheep and the goats, some of you will go to the right and some of you go to the left. This is the judgment. Now here's where it gets a little hairy. Um, so it says that all stand, great and small, doesn't matter who you are. And that includes us. Even as believers who are resurrected in the first resurrection, we still have to be judged. It's a point unto man wants to die and then the judgment. Now, a lot of people will say that we as believers are not judged because Christ took our judgment. And that is a future effect this is that judgment. Christ took on our wrath. He has not taken our judgment. These are the books that are being opened. In Psalm 139, it says that there is a book that will be written about our life, that God essentially has a library of every one of our lives in books written about our lives, some big, some small, right? And, and, and this library in this book will be pulled out when you or I am judged and it will look in, at our deeds to judge our deeds. And they will look in the Lamb's book of life to see if our name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And then this will be the judgment where Christ stands in our stead. See, when we talk about what does it mean to be saved, we say it in a now physical sense. But the depiction of scripture is that it is a future sense that we will be saved from the judgment of God. Christ already endured his, our wrath for our sins, but he will be judged in our stead as perfect and righteous so that we might enter the kingdom because we were written in blood in the Lamb's book of life. And so a lot of people might argue this because there's a lot of belief that we are not judged but nowhere in scripture to say that we are not judged. We will be judged. And that's a good thing because we know who's going to stand in our stead, the one who is perfect and righteous in every way. And so our judgment, yeah, he's going to open up that book and be like, Fozzie, dude, come on. I'm like, I know, I know, I'm sorry. But if you see there's some red blood right there from Jesus, like I'm, I'm written. He's like, I know, but you did this. And I'm like, I know, I know, I'm sorry, God. But, but everybody Whoever lives in any time, form, or fashion, in any culture and time in history, has to be judged. If they have a soul in their body, they must be judged. And there is one judgment. This is that one judgment. And those who have placed their faith in the Old Testament or the New, right, before Christ or after Christ, their time of judgment will be the same. And the person who will stand in their place of judgment is the same. It will be Christ himself. So when we are going up there and maybe it's like a, like a video of our lives and like everybody's behind it looking at the shame of our sin and like God's opening up this book and it's like an illustration of like, you did this. And it's like, I know, I'm sorry. But like, you're not going to be standing there alone being judged. Christ himself is standing beside you who is taking that judgment for you. Like that's the beautiful picture. So when we say we are saved, we are saying that in faith. We are saying that not in reality immediately, like you don't pray this prayer and then somehow there's this weird change that happens. The Spirit of God comes to protect you, to seal you into the family of God. That's the change. So that ultimately when the end comes and you stand in that judgment spot, Christ will stand in your stead. Then you will be actively saved. Now we are trusting to be saved. And this is the perfect picture of faith moving forward. And for those in the Old Testament, they trusted in the salvation of a Messiah to be trusted in judgment. We have seen the Messiah, so now we just trust in his stead or to stand in our place in judgment. And so this is the great white throne judgment. It is the place where the sheep and the goats become separate. 
It's a place where one of the hardest parables Jesus ever said, and whether it's a parable or true, I kind of cling to it as true, where he says, some of you will say to me, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I don't even know you. Some of you, he'll say, uh, you know, thank you for when you fed me when I was hungry and you gave me clothes when I was naked and you gave me water when I was thirsty. And we'll say, when did I do that? He'll say, what you did for the least of these, you did for me. Some of you have entertained angels without even knowing it. And this is the reality of God, is that God is actively at work in every way, shape, and form. And then to some, he will say, be gone. I didn't even know you. Because when I was hungry, you didn't give me any food. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me any drink. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. You did the, I'll pray for you, and you drove away. And so some will be goats who thought they were sheep and will be cast to the second death to live essentially in eternity in hellfire forever. That, that, is, that is a great question, and I would tend to believe that they might claim that, whether they had put their faith in there. Uh, it, again, it's a faith aspect, right? David raped Bathsheba, covered it with murder, but he was a man after God's own heart, right? And that's the reality of, of God and his grace, is that even while David did that in that sinfulness, he was still a, a, a man who loved God. He, oh, he'll be judged. So will that be something that God's going to say no? I mean, you know, I mean, no. Well, but here's the thing. Christ's blood covers over all sin. So in the judgment of our books, I don't know that I trust or I believe that it's a judgment of the negatives. I highlighted that only because I'm a detestable human being and God loves me and has saved me because I put my faith in him. But I think those books are a highlight of the things, of the sacrifices, of the love, of the compassion that we extended in, in essentially a picture of God towards others. I think that's when we fed those people. That's when we clothed those people. That's when, when we entertained angels without knowing it. I think our books of our lives are about the good that we did for the kingdom of God and not the negative that we did because Christ paid for the negative. So the negative, just like he says, your sin is far away as the east is from the west. It can never connect again. So why would God bring up the thing that he had already forgiven? I think that our books of our lives are an indication of the amount of sacrifice and life that we lived for the kingdom of God and not for ourselves. And so, again, like I said, some books are going to be very thin. Some books are going to be very thick. Um, in any case... Those who stayed, uh, who did not go to the second death are those who put their faith and trust in God. And those who didn't, I want to say, just, you can hold me to the fire of this. I want to believe that there is some other aspect and some other opportunity of grace to be extended to people again. But it doesn't say it here. I, I say that because I want my mom and I want my dad to go to heaven but neither of them have put their faith and trust in Christ. And so I want desperately for the Bible to be wrong in that way um, because I would love to see them there. But I know that my God is a God of promise and a God of his word. And, and whether we like it or not, his word remains. And so if they don't, then there is a consequence for their life. And I don't get any say in that. But that's, yeah, a whole different ballgame. Uh, any other questions? Great White Throne Judgment. Excite anybody? <laughs> I'm excited for it. That'll be, it'll be great. I, I get to see Jesus there. I'm chilling with him. Whether it's a literal or I don't know, but like, Yeah. I, yeah, I've never, you, you just, once, you, once you have placed your faith in Christ, you, you don't have to fear judgment. What, what, what is, yeah, you just, you get the opportunity to praise him, so. Any? No, I just had a question about yeah. the Jews, but it's not about No, please. So, I know Jewish people, they don't believe in like Messiah, 
So, but those are God's chosen people. I don't get that. It's really confusing to me how they don't understand or they don't get the New Testament if they're chosen people. Well, and, and here's the thing. I love my son, but I can't love him into a place of faith. I can teach him, I can show him, I can lead him, I can guide him, but he ultimately has to make the decision. Just like my mom and just like my dad, right? For the Jews, it was the, it's the exact same. They still believe that a Messiah will come. And to me, as you read through this text and as you unfold through the book of Revelation, I think that is the second option. I think that the return of Christ will be their opportunity to re-put their faith in the Messiah, which is why I think Christ, when he came, he only showed half of the reason why, because the half of the reason why is when he came, he only fulfilled half of the prophecies because most of the prophecies and the reason why many Jews didn't put their faith in him is because he didn't reestablish the kingdom. He didn't reestablish Israel. He didn't rule and reign on a throne forever. And so all of these things that they had placed as the Messiah, he didn't fulfill those. And so he only fulfilled half of them. And so when he came, he's a good prophet because he fulfilled half of them, but he wasn't the Messiah. And so the second opportunity for them to put their faith is when Christ returns, where they can then trust in the Messiah again because he will reestablish Israel. He will reestablish the kingdom and all the things ultimately to fulfill prophecy. Because that's, if God is a God of his word and his word will always be true, then his prophecy has to come true. So the Messiah has to reestablish his kingdom, has to sit on his throne. All of that has to come true to fulfill the prophecy, ultimately to showcase God is perfect in his word. And so I think Israel gets a second chance. In all honesty, we, we get 400 chances, right? Right, and they were given chances and lots of chances. Exactly. The, the, the other aspect is, is to, to realize, too, you know, some people believe that, you know, you, God only hears prayers if you, of the saved people and things like that. That was a thing that went around in the uh, uh, early 1800s, that, that God only hears the prayers of believers. And it's like, well, that would suck because there's a lot of other prayers that I prayed before I became a believer and, and realizing when those things were coming true, that that led me towards a place of understanding of Christ. And so to say that God has limited himself is, is, is an overstepping. But if that's the case, then Israel still prays to God. They're still faithful to God. They still try and live in obedience to the law, exactly to God. So there's a reality that they're, two steps, they're, they're a step and a half into the kingdom. They just haven't placed their faith and trust in the saving works of Christ. And so, or the Messiah. And so that's where I think that essentially eschatology is their second chance. God continually gives us chance. So why not? Right. Anything else? Any other? All right. I'm going to stay awake for like four hours now. Uh, let me pray real quick. <laughs> Um, I hope it was good. I hope, uh, that, uh, it was beneficial and and man, I hope you go home and just rejoice that that next judgment, that opportunity is just an opportunity to stand next to Christ and just praise God. Um, God, thank you so much, uh, for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us, for what, uh, it is telling us mostly about you and your character. Um, God, it's, it's all of this imagery and all of these words and all of the context and the culture and the history and the original audience and all of that is great and it's wonderful in meaning and in learning and in understanding, uh, but none of it compares to us getting to know you better. God, the, the fact that we get to open your word and see your character and see your nature and see who you truly are is just awe-inspiring. And so, God, I praise you for that. I praise you for uh, the chance to know you better. I pray that you uh, uh, bless every one of us here. Um, God, that we walk away 
uh, entrenched in your love, entrenched in your grace, uh, knowing more and more every day how you have saved us by your grace and, and how we are now in a new relationship with you. God, you are an amazing God. Your kingdom is to be praised. Thank you so much for all that you have done for us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.